Benny Kovash, welcome to the Pre-Construction Podcast. Thanks, man. Happy to be here. Looking forward to it. We're just going through your your name, Kovach, making sure that I got the pronunciation right. Um, it's okay because everybody gets my name wrong. Um, although it's it's Welsh, Gareth. Well, Gareth is Welsh, and McGlynn is uh, a little bit Irish. So, um, but no, I, I like Kovach. Where where did it come from again? It's um it's Croatian, and uh, growing up just outside of Pittsburgh, um, Western Pennsylvania is very Eastern European. So everyone knows how to pronounce it up there. Um, but uh, once I left for school and moved down here, it gets uh, it gets butchered a little bit. But everyone's pretty close. Kovac is pretty close, but yeah, Kovac. Good man. So I'm, I suspect there's plenty of good soccer teams with the European influence up there. <laughs> I assume. I'm not a big soccer guy. During World Cup, uh, I think Croatia made a nice run, so we were good. <laughs> very good. They always do. Modric is the main guy, isn't he? I, I, I'd rely on you. <laughs> he on. is, he is. Good man. Well, listen, thanks for thanks for making the time. Um, really sure. good good to have you on the, the pre-construction podcast. Um, for anybody or any of our listeners that don't know you, give us a quick 30-second intro um, of you, where you're working, whereabouts you are in the US. Sure. Uh, absolutely. I'm Benny Kovach, pre-construction executive with Davis Construction. Um, I live in Fairfax, Virginia, but our office is in Rockville, Maryland. And uh, we do all of our work primarily right here in the uh, DC metro area. Brilliant, good man. And we will get to that towards the end. But let's uh, let's bring you right back. Um, we talked about it beforehand. Penn State University, nationally known. But we, I want to go into the, the the degree that you took. It's Bachelor of Architect, uh, Architecture Engineering. So it's quite different. So give us, even before that, before you go into that, why architecture? Was it always a passion of yours? Who, who was it influenced by? Um, so, uh, you know, growing up, I was like to... Um to sketch and, uh, and, but I was also good at math and science just naturally. And um, so I, early on, I thought I wanted to be an architect or a landscape architect actually. Um, and there was a small architect in the town I grew up and um, actually uh, had a part-time job after school. I would walk to the, to the office after school and help them with lettering. This is way back before CAD and everything was, was hand-drawn and hand-lettered. Um, I would uh, help them letter their drawings. I'd, help, I'd make copies and transfer, um, submittal comments. Um, and so I, I kind of spent my high school years, you know, working part-time in, in an architect's office. So kind of got an introduction into the industry that way. Um, so I thought I wanted to go to school for engineering or excuse me, for architecture. Um, but I had an older cousin that, that went to Penn State and she had a, a civil engineering degree and um, had visited her a couple of times when she was there. And, and she introduced me to the architectural engineering program which kind of seemed like a good mix of um, the design side along with the engineering side, not saying engineers don't design, but you, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, and they also had a construction management option within the program. And so it seemed like it was a good opportunity to, um, you know, kind of work both sides of my brain. I was pretty excited about it. Brilliant. Um, it's, I mean, we, we, I know we talked about it and you will go into more depth about it, but it seems like the perfect uh, pre-construction and estimating. It's, it seems like the one of the key focused degrees with the, the, the kind of touches more on pre-construction and estimating. Give us an idea of, of what kind of modules you learned, um, how the semesters ran. Sure. So within the construction management classes, we did have um, uh, assignments and, and projects that focused on pre-construction and estimating. Uh, not so much pre-construction as, as we know it now, early involvement. It was more, um, you know, uh, quantity surveying and apply a unit price to it and come up with a mock bid, that type of stuff. Um, and we focused a lot on site logistics and, um, and, and scheduling and so forth were, was kind of the main focus of the construction management um, courses that we took. Um, but what was kind of cool about the program or unique about the program was we, we studied um, multiple, multiple types of engineering, structural and mechanical and electrical, and they're all focused around building systems. So like our, the mechanical, excuse me, the mechanical engineering courses that we took were focused on you know, like building HVAC uh, design and the electrical courses were around power distribution and lighting as opposed to like superconductors, you know, like general broad electrical engineering. Um, and then your structural engineering was about building um, superstructures and uh, you take so many credits in each one of those disciplines and, and some classes in construction management. Um, and uh, then you choose your focus and you spend your last two years, you know, more in depth in those, in those options and your fifth year, you do an undergrad thesis. It's, it's pretty unique. Brilliant, brilliant. What did you focus on? Construction management is, is actually kind of funny. I started out, I picked structural just because the one or two uh, friends that I had met early on at school were structural. I'm like, that ah, sounds cool. And I had a summer internship working um, in, in Pennsylvania uh, in, with a structural, well, it was a 
In Pennsylvania, they have what's called multiple primes. So they have these firms that have all design house, all the different design disciplines in-house, as well as a construction management or a program management arm. So I spent the summer in the structural engineering department and was just reviewing rebar shop drawings. And I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if this is uh, really what I want to be doing. And uh, so with about six weeks left in the summer, they asked, you know, are you enjoying things? Is there anything else you want to try? Do you want to go out in the field a little bit? We need some help with the program management. And I was like, yeah, let's do that. Um, and I just really enjoyed the, uh, the relationship building and the interaction and, and the, um, the more people uh, focused approach to uh, the construction management side of things. So when I, when I got back to school in the fall, I immediately changed my option from structural over to construction management. Brilliant, brilliant. And then obviously completing the, the degree, it was a, it was unique because it was a five year degree. Was there a uh, did you say there was a postgrad? So there's it's look, there's options for an integrated master's now. I believe it was, it was new when I was graduating, um, but it's it's five years undergrad, all undergrad, and the fifth year, uh, the big portion of your the heavy lifting you do that year is your uh, undergrad thesis. So um, you're supposed to ideally take a project that you worked on over the summer as an intern, and you know redesign some of the systems and dig deep um, a, a deep dive into one of the uh, systems and, and do Brilliant. a detailed analysis and present it. And, Super, cool. super. So then you uh, straight into Balfour as a project engineer. Um, how yeah. was that? And I, again, I always like to ask this question. It's all well and good sitting in a, in a classroom learning off the blackboard. But when you get into the, the big bad word of construction, it can be slightly different. Did anything surprise you? Yeah, absolutely. It was actually so long ago. It was, uh, it was Centex, you know, back before Balfour Beatty um, acquired them. So it, it goes back quite a while. But it was... Um, you know, like uh, most of the students we see coming out of school, we know they, they majority of them want to be a project manager, and, and that's what I wanted to do too. Um, the project I was supposed to be working on was delayed, so they put me in um, estimating until it supposedly started up. And I worked on a couple uh, hard bids, a couple government bids, and I really liked it. I, I liked the, um, you know, uh, cracking open a new set of drawings every couple of weeks as opposed to, you know, being involved with one project. Um, but I worked on a, a particular bid out at FDA, the FDA campus in White Oak, and we, we won that job. And so rather than putting me on the job I was originally supposed to start on, um, they sent me out there to work on that as a, as a project engineer. And that was a really cool way to start your career to learn in chrono I learned chronologically to be involved with the project from the time it came in the door, work on the bid, work on buyout, and then head out into the field and, and help run the project was really cool. Um, but it was... Um, uh, an awakening in college. I thought I was very organized, um, but I wasn't, <laughs> I, I wasn't uh, uh, as organized as, as I needed to be. So I really need to, needed to catch up on and learn some, some new habits quickly. Well, Benny, let's be honest. That I mean, that is the the best introduction you can you can get to for me anyway. And I I believe that every project engineer, field engineer, APM, assistant superintendent should do exactly that. They should run a project from start to cradle to grave. So they should get involved in estimating pre-construction, find out what it's all about, then go out on on the project and deliver it. And and it gives them a sense of you know what when I was looking at the numbers on that 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 staircase or whatever it may be. Now I know that maybe I would have done something different. Um, I think I think that's the only way to, to, to really learn. And listen, you can get loads of good mentors and, and have loads of people that, that can advise you throughout the whole thing, but seeing and feeling it the whole way through is, is something that's that, that everyone should experience, I think. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Um, after uh, working on a couple of projects and getting back into the office as an estimator and working on some uh, conceptual and, and, and schematic estimates that really helped, you know, the field experience really helped fill in the gaps. Um, I also, you know, when, when you're working on uh, just a quick budget or something conceptual or ROM, um, you know, you, you're not always going to invite a ton of subcontractors um, at that point. It's not, you don't want to exercise their time if, if not be, if you don't need to. Um, but the relationships you built working day to day in the field with those subcontractors, those are the guys that you now call and say, hey, man, I'm looking at something, 300,000 square foot office. You know, what are you guys seeing? You know, yeah. These come in per square foot. And, and you really get a head start there as opposed to just starting and estimating. And you're looking at a list of hundreds and hundreds of subcontractors. You don't really know where to start. So. Um, 100%. I agree. Yeah. Experience yeah. Is yeah. And then one thing I did like about your career, I mean, it was quite quite good at Balfour, field experience, senior estimator, but business partner outreach manager. Give us an idea. It's quite a mouthful. And I'm, I, listen, out of anybody, I am seeing all, all all kinds of creative titles right now. But give us an idea of what, what was in that role, what was the responsibilities of that role, and what were the, the deliverables? 
Sure. So um, I, I got the field experience and then I was getting the estimating experience and then I was getting to the point where um, I could do some uh, conceptual and, and schematic type stuff on my own. And um, so there was less of a need to um, work, you know, with, with a big estimating team on, on hard bids. Um, at the same time, I was really getting involved with networking and business development, um, out, outgoing extroverted guy. I was involved with a lot of different associations. Um, at the time, um, uh, Balfour Beatty was chasing uh, a lot of government work and they all have um, small business requirements that go along with it. So I was really tasked with improving subcontractor relations with an emphasis on finding new um, qualified small businesses that we could get involved with our projects and even potentially partner with. So um, they were having trouble coming up with a, a, a title that was like 50% business development, 25% estimating, and 25% subcontractor relations. And, and that's the title that the, um, that the marketing group came up with. So if nothing else, it was a good icebreaker on the business card when you meet somebody and they're like, business partner outreach manager, what's, you know, what, what's that all about? So <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good talking point to, to break the ice, I have to yeah. tell you. And, and come here, so, uh, I mean, one of the big things, um, as you know, a lot of junior mid-level estimators, even experienced estimators listen to the podcast. And I think one of the biggest things that people struggle with is building that relationships and finding uh, subcontractors. What would you say out, out of that time that you spent doing that, what, what kind of takeaways and what key skills do you need to be able to do that? Um, it's, you don't need to, um, stress yourself out knowing everything, every little thing about every trade. The subcontractors are the, are the experts, right? And they're our biggest uh, resource. And so, um, building a relationship with a few key subs and a few key trades really gets you ahead of the game. I uh, really recommend getting involved with the, you know, tons of subcontractor and contractor, um, networking associations that are around, um, being able to put a uh, face with the name, you know, you can pick up the phone and call, um, uh, Joe Smith at XYZ Masonry a hundred times, but until you bump into him at a networking event and, and put a face with a name and, um, you know, share a handshake and a beer, you know, that's really where the, the relationships are, are grown. 100%. Couldn't agree more. Um, and there is quite a lot of, of networking events um, that's happened. Obviously, not, not as many face-to-face -face <laughs> right now, but uh, when right we get now. back to normal um, or, or the new normal, then there, there, there will be opportunities. So that's that's key. Um, you mentioned something there about the extrovert um, in you. Um, it's not something that you associate with an estimator or a pre-construction mm -hmm. professional. Um, was that confidence that, 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 that you grew or were you, were you always naturally an outgoing social person? Uh, I mean, I've always been um, an outgoing, silly, big guy, right? I mean, it's um, this is part of my personality. Um, and actually, I had to, um, rather than uh, developing that or growing that, it was almost something I had to overcome. Like in, in estimating in, in, in a hard bid reality where you, you need to get into, dig into the details, um, I really struggled with, with the attention span and, and staying focused on, on the details. Um, and that's kind of how I gravitated more to pre-construction where it's more um, client focused, it's more big picture, it's more creativity, um, it's more presentation. Um, and that's really how I've, uh, over the last um, eight years at Davis, have, have really grown more on the, on the pre-construction side. You're, you're coming up with creative solutions, uh, working hand in hand with your ops team. Um, you're very client focused, client facing, um, a lot of presentations, a lot of um, opportunities to, to bring in more work to the company. Brilliant. Yeah. And I, listen, I, people talk, say to me, they ring me up and say, listen, I'm, I'm a pre-construction manager, pre-construction director within a, a mid-sized GC. We don't have any sales team. I am the sales team. To me, yeah. the key sales people, I mean, they always say that the key sales people are, are the, the, the ops guys that deliver the project. And listen, they're all part of the, the sales cycle. But to me, pre-construction and estimating and that senior client facing pre-construction professional is becoming more of a, a key person within the sales life cycle. Yeah, uh, it's cool to hear you say that. We, uh, I always joke when I'm, I'm talking to people that are new to our team or meet somebody new in the industry in that you kind of, the more time you spend in estimating pre-construction, there's two, really two types of personalities. There's more of the, um, like the, uh, the leader, the client facing, let's win this job, rah, rah type of leader. And then you've got, you've got the estimator that, um, you know, is re really just enjoys spending time at their desk. Um, and they're very concerned whether there's 800 or 804 doors they can't get their takeoff right and, and you need both and there and there's both are awesome both are very admirable um you need both but i've always tended to be on on the other side and um you just got to find what what works i mean when you're happy what you're doing it's it's easier to do it than you know trying to force yourself into something that you're not naturally good at right 
But listen, Benny, you're 100% right. I mean, we all love sports, right? There's not an NFL team, uh, an NBA team that has got Michael 11 Michael Jordans or whatever. I don't even know how many is on a basketball team. You know what I mean? You need the people that are going to win the ball back, the defense guys, the offense guys, the, the, the thinkers of the game, the guys who are going to control the pace of the game. You need all types. I mean, that's... That's essentially my day today is finding out and managing people's expectations. They ring me up all the time. They say, listen, I've got a, a team of three estimators. I've got Joe, who's an unbelievable estimator, really good client facing, um, outgoing, does a lot of sales. I need another one of those. Well, I said, why do you need another one of those? I mean, if he's doing, if he's got that tied down, maybe you need somebody on the other side that's going to be able to get down deep down into the detail and make sure that you guys don't miss anything on the mechanical, electrical, or piping side. Um, so I, you're right. That that is, to me is a variety and a, a diverse background within estimating teams. Generally, are the more successful. Yeah. Absolutely. And you still need to cross train, right? You know, you still want um, the person that is going to spend the time digging down into the details, which we all need to do more of. But, um, you know, he, that person, he or she needs the opportunity to lead teams and they need some experience, um, you know, being client facing. And at the same time, um, the other, the other type of leader needs to, um, you know, force themselves to get into the details and, and, you know, from time to time, just, uh, you know, keep their ear to the ground, understand which way the market's going. Um, you know, stay in contact with subcontractors and, um, you know, really just have their, have their finger on the pulse and uh, you really need to cross train to do that. Good man. So let's stay on this subject, cross training, sure. uh, your pre-construction executive now at, at James. Is there anything in particular that you think you do well with junior estimators when you bring them on board? Is there any, and without giving away secret sauce, we're all trying to help each other here. <laughs> Um, I mean, I've, I've been very lucky in my career that I've, I've always had really cool bosses. Like I, I've never had, um, I've never been in a situation where, where I came home and I was frustrated that I wasn't getting the attention and, and the development that I needed. And so I, I really um, try to uh, give my people space and let them, you know, figure some things out on their own, obviously keep tabs on them. I want them to, um, I'm never going to let them make a major mistake, um, but I, I do feel like you learn from mistakes. Um, when I'm showing or explaining something to somebody new, um, I like to make sure I take the time uh, to explain why that's how we do things, um, but also give them an the opportunity of, so here's what the end result needs to be, and here's what we're protecting against, and here's what we're striving for. If you can think of a better way to get there, you know, let, let me know. Let, let's talk about it if you think you have it figured out. Um, I remember when I was asked those types of questions, and I thought I was beating the world and, and could, could solve all those problems quicker and more efficiently, and Sometimes it worked. Most of the time it was like, oh, I get it now. That's why we yeah. do it this way. And, you know, so I try and let um, people know that are, you know, my teammates um, make those same realizations on their own, but try and guide them on the right way. If they're struggling with something or something's taking them a long time, you know, you can kind of give them some, some tricks of the trade say, hey, you know, well, if you're, you know, trying to, it's taking too long to take off all the drywall ceilings in the bathrooms, we already took up all the tile floor. It's going to be pretty close to the same quantity, right? Especially in, you know, in, in the pre-con side of things. Um, like, oh yeah, that makes sense. So just, um, I really want people to develop their own way of doing things, but at the same time, steer them away from the, from the major pitfalls and always remind them what the goals are and why we're doing things a certain way. Yeah, that's it. I mean, there's no right or wrong way to do it. You've got to find your own way. But then if you say, if you get the, 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 the real, the tricks of the trade to be able to get there quicker, it's better. So speaking of getting there quicker or expediting the, the estimating or pre-construction process, Let's talk pre-construction technology. Um, how involved are you guys in technology? Um, what's the technology, especially within pre-construction estimating? What's the the what's the new things on the block? Is there anything cool? Any cool um, technologies that you're using? Uh, you know, we we hear about lots of new technologies. I mean, at Davis, we have what amounts to an R and D group basically, and they spend a lot of time uh, investigating new um, construction technologies. Um, the majority of it is focused on operations. I mean, that's, you know, that's what we do. We're a builder. Um, there are a, a ton of different um, estimating software platforms out there. Um, and, you know, some of them are more focused on just the quantity takeoff, quantity survey portion of it. Some of it um, has the ability to integrate with pricing, right? Um, what I've come across and um, throughout my career, we've looked at a bunch of different software packages. It's the, there's still a disconnect that integrates it all together, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's, some software that's better for extracting quantities, um, but then, you know, it, it doesn't have the flexibility as something as simple as Excel for producing an estimate, right? Um, so I, I still think there's a huge opportunity for um, a, a software platform to integrate 
to bring in the gaps. Um, what we're focused on now is trying to find a solution where we can integrate. We have something we call the Davis 360, which is a, a 360 degree view of a project that really integrates estimating pre-construction, marketing, obviously operations, safety, scheduling, um, uh, virtual construction, all those different um, groups that we have. And um, we're really trying to find um, a one-stop shop where we can integrate you know, the pricing with the, um, with the lead tracking and, and the, the CRM type components, how, how we can integrate schedule into it, how we can then uh, transform or, or transition what we already have over to the project team when they start running it so they can um, maintain cost controls. So there's, um, there's still some opportunities out there to, um, I think it's gonna come down to more customization, I think is what uh, it's gonna come down to. There's nothing really, every contractor operates a little differently. So it's tough to find something out of the box that, um, that works best for you. But I think as these um, platforms become more and more customizable, I think that's really where it's, where it's headed. Brilliant. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, it's it's fine. It's hard to find the, the right mix of collaboration, especially with the, the we talked about the three legged stool, the owner, the architect, and and the contractor. Um, how do you find? I mean, you pre construction executive, your personality. How do you find communicating with the architect and the owner? Have you got specific um, workflows that you use? Um, maybe technologies that you use. Uh, how do you keep them up to date? Sure. So we are um, right now um, going through uh, the process of ramping up a new CRM system. Um, uh, previously, we have uh, we're, we're set up so, somewhat in business units. We have different VPs of you know of of healthcare and office and residential. And for the most part, um, in my time there, we haven't had anybody with the title of business development. So really, each group is uh, responsible for bringing in their own opportunities and main, in maintaining relationships and contact with their own clients. And then there was just, we've gone through a couple of different repositories of how we're tracking those leads and so forth. And right now we're, we're um, in the throes of uh, breaking into new CRM and, and transitioning contacts over but at the same time. And more importantly, we're looking at the processes of how we track those leads and, and how we maintain contacts. Cause it's, it can be embarrassing when you pick up the phone to talk to someone and they're like, Oh, I already talked to Jim about that yesterday or um, you know, vice versa. When they give you a call and say, Hey, do you have a chance to talk to Jeff about, blah, blah, blah. Like, oh no, I haven't had a chance to, to catch up with him yet. So um, there's always room for improvement there. And um, we, I mean, that's the, that's the best way I can describe it. We're, we're working on it. That's something that everywhere I've been in my career has been a focus on how can we do this better? Yeah. And I've been places where they have dedicated full-time business development people. And I've been places where like now Davis, where uh, each group's kind of responsible for bringing in their own opportunities. So definitely yeah. pros and cons of both. Absolutely. And is there anything pre-construction technology ways, estimating ways, even the, the, the market inside presenting bids on bid day, uh, visualizations to, to clients, assembly, BIM, VDC. Is there anything that really excites you about technology going forward? Um, what would you like to, what would you like to see it do? So when, when we were talking previously and you asked me if there was something I wanted to make sure you asked me and I said, no, it's amazing that you came up with this one because this is this is this is, a, this is, a, this is a, uh, something just, that I'm working just to on. Just to let right everyone, everyone know, this is not pre pre. Uh, pre <laughs> no, it wasn't. No, I had the opportunity to tee you up and I passed. But anyway, <laughs> uh, great great question. Um, so one of our um, uh, corporate initiatives for 2021 as part of our business plan is how we can grow our toolbox of deliverables. Um, how if we're handing a client um, just a boring Excel estimate you know, how, how can we enhance that, whether it's visually, but also give them something that's, that's more meaningful, um, how we can uh, better our presentations. Um, so right now we're working on things uh, with an emphasis on very, very early on when you get involved with a project and you've got like five or six, 11 by 17 renderings, right? And you carry a $350,000 allowance for a monumental stair that you kind of think it looks like there's a monumental stair in the main lobby. You're not sure yet, right? So you carry that allowance and then you always get asked the question, well, what does that get me? And you're like, eh, I don't know. The last one we built was 350,000, right? So what we're trying to do is come up with tools that, you know, show precedent images, All right? Well, here's a stair that we built at, you know, XYZ Fifth Street. Um, and it, it came in at $450,000. Here's one that was $550,000. And the main difference was the railings on this one have true curved glass whereas these railings didn't. Um, and so we can give them some idea of what, of what they're getting, what, what that allowance will get them moving forward and really break it down even to, into, you know, like our residential projects. Um, early on when it's very conceptual, we're carrying allowances for cabinets, we're carrying allowances for countertops, we're carrying allowances for appliances, all those things that obviously will be designed eventually. 
Um, but just to be able to show them, all right, in, in this price range, you can get this type of cabinet, this type of cabinet, this type of cabinet. Um, really just help them inform their decisions early on. And that, <clears throat> that's something, building that toolbox of, of, um, of uh, presentation-worthy deliverables is something we're trying to grow right now. Brilliant. And would that would that kind of tie in with a, a hot topic at the minute, which is historical data, um, which is data that, as you say, that you projects that you've pre previously previously done, but as you say, you want to be able to show them a visual of the completed project and maybe even the cost flow of what the the client originally thought that the staircase was going to cost, and it actually came out at this because they wanted to give it make it a little bit more sexy. Yeah, I mean, it's um, everywhere I've been. That's been a struggle. Um, capturing historic data, right? So you, you put together these estimates, okay? And then um, maybe someone else runs the bid. And so um, if someone asks me, oh, where did that job come in at? My instincts are to go to my last estimate, but that's not the most, that's not the latest and greatest number, right? I gotta go find the bid, the bid sheet um, from the GMP. And so being able to capture that and retroactively update what we worked on um, at, at the schematic and conceptual phases um, and bring those numbers up to date, that's tough. Um, and then again, I, I keep saying, you know, just integrating all the information that we have is, is we have photos of all these projects. We have the bid data. Um, we have the previous estimates. But just finding a way to bring it all together and have it somewhere that it's easily accessible um, is something that we're really focused on this year. Brilliant. And is that, is that proprietary? Is that going to be done in-house by you guys? Or are you going to in, involve a third party? So we're, we're doing it in-house. In uh, we put together a small task team. Now, the, the bigger picture with the CRM, we have someone helping us, external helping us with that, but it's still our, um, uh, our internal uh, IT and uh, business solutions groups are the ones that are spearheading it, but obviously we're collaborating with them. Um, Brilliant. With, with the people that are providing the, the software. That'll, that'll be special if you get that right. I'm looking forward to seeing how that goes. Um, so let, let's uh, let's let's kind of step away now. I mean, you're deliver. You've been with some Balfour and James now recently. Talk to me about projects and, and delivery styles. What what do you think that works the best? Um, and, and is there any kind of landmark projects that you thought you know what I thoroughly enjoyed that? Um, and and generally it's the ones that turn out well in relation to <laughs> the margin being being healthy. <laughs> Sure. Um, um, you know, we, we uh, are in a fortunate position at, at Davis where we negotiate a, a big portion of our work. And even if it's not just a, a purely negotiated job, it, it's typically competed on a fee and GC basis as opposed to a hard bid. Um, uh, more in the last year, 18 months and looking forward, we do see the market kind of shifting back a little bit um, to more uh, hard bid opportunities. But um, at the same time, we're still looking for um, where we can excel, which is um, getting involved early, helping steer the design, helping steer the spec, um, helping the owner make decisions, and then you know negotiating the job on a fee and GC um, basis. Uh, the, the cost of the work, there's so many good general contractors in town, so many good subcontractors in town. The cost of the work, for the most part, is going to be the cost of the work. It's going to fluctuate a little bit based on your relationships with the subs. You know, so if we can get in early and, and, and um, you know, let our clients know that we have their best interests and we're working with the design team to make sure their vision is still preserved. Um, we're going to bring the best subcontractors to the table and we're going to deliver the, uh, the best product. Um, there's so many examples of, of that working for us. It's, it's really the, the majority of what I, um, what I do. It's, it's hard to pick one. I, I know that's, that's a crappy answer, but. Um, <laughs> It'll come to you. I'm sure. I'm sure there's one uh, that, that that stands out, um, and I'm sure that there's one that stands out. You're walking through town. You go. You know what? I was a big part of what, bringing that bringing that project through. Um, yeah, for sure. My um my, my youngest son is very um, into rank and order. You know, Daddy, what's the third fastest race car in the world? What's what's the the eighth tallest building? And I never know the answer. But um, you know, we did work on the um, Capital One Tower in, in Tyson's Corner. Nice. Um, which we were, we were told was was the tallest building in Virginia. So um, when we drive around the Beltway, my kid likes to point that one out. Yeah, there you are. So talk to me, Fairfax, Virginia. Um, as you may know, we we here at Niche we we re, re, relocate a lot of estimators and pre-construction professionals all over the U.S. Um, but Fairfax, um, Virginia is one of the places we do a lot of work in. Give people an idea of, of what, what's cool about it. Um, what do you like about living there? What it's, what, I mean, you, you've obviously got kids. What's it like um, as a community, as, as a, what are the schools like? Give us a, give us a taste. Sure. Well, if, if you're not familiar with, with the D.C. area, you got the you got D.C. and you got the, the Beltway Route 495 that, that encircles the city. And just outside of the Beltway to the west is Fairfax. And 
Um, really, uh, we ended up settling here because um, it was close to the, the Sentex office that I worked at right out of school. And it was, kind of, it was a happy mistake. I mean, to be honest, I should have been looking for, you know, apartments closer to where my first job site was going to be as opposed to the office. But um, and really just fell in love with the area. There, there's so much to do. Um, and you're so accessible to DC and in Arlington and all the fun spots when you're young, but at the same time, um, you're not, you're not dealing with as much hustle and bustle that, as if you live inside the beltway. Um, but as we got, as we gotten older and had kids, you know, we really, um, still love Fairfax, but for a different reason, the schools are amazing. Um, all the resources are amazing. All the parks and, and opportunities and resources are great. Um, we have a cool little townhouse community, um, really close with all our neighbors and, you know, kids have lots of friends, similar age and in, in, in school to get, well, not in school now, they're, well, they're in school upstairs right now, but, um, <laughs> you know, they're, uh, you know, when, when things get back to normal and, and previously they were in, in the same grades together. And so we have our, our, our potted little um, cul-de-sac community out there where we kind of keep everyone out and we stay in, all the parents are working from home, so we feel it's pretty safe. Good, good. Delighted to hear that. Um, and obviously, listen, working from home, it's not easy. I've got two kids as well, four and a half year old and a two and a half year old. Homeschooling is the bane of my life, but we get there. Um, but working from home, it's diff- well, it's difficult, it's convenient. I think the jury's still out whether this is going to be something that's going to move forward, especially within pre-construction and estimating. I think the perception out there is that you can do pre-construction and estimating at home and you don't need to be in the office. I mean, I am a huge believer and beg to differ, uh, but give me an idea of, of how it's been. I mean, you're a pre-construction executive, you're in a leadership role. Has it been difficult? How have you, how have you managed it? And are you a fan of it? Would you prefer to get people back to the office? Um, if the kids were in school, I'd be a much bigger fan of it. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm with you on that one. Um, it's, uh, if nothing, it's, it's shown us that we can be more flexible and I think that, you know, going forward, I don't think we'll get to a point where it's like, all right, you have the opportunity to just work from home. Uh, I still think we'll get back to the point where the majority of the time will be spent in the office, but um, everyone, you know, getting the technology and the resources to be able to work from home on an as needed basis really just improves everyone's work-life balance um, as opposed to it being a major deal. If you had to meet a contractor at your house or um, you have a different appointment or, um, you know, if, if I have meetings in DC or somewhere else in Virginia, I don't really see the need to drive all the way to Rockville for a couple hours in the morning just to come back in the afternoon. So I think if anything, one, one of the silver lines is just built in some flexibility going forward. Um, but I really think the, the technical aspects we can still do separately and remotely. Um, but as we were saying um, before we jumped on, you know, it's the, it's the soft skills, the, the career development, the camaraderie that I really think takes a, takes a hit. Um, there's still technically opportunities to collaborate on projects. We don't really see much of a dip in that. Um, but it's the, uh, you know, it's the, it's the department happy hours. It's the, um, uh, the catching up with someone that, that isn't necessarily a part of your team, but is still uh, a good resource, a good relationship for you in the office. Um, and, and again, the, the career development, just checking in with people, um, making sure they're still ambitious and, and aggressive and happy. You know what I mean? It's, um, yeah. you can tell when something's bothering somebody you know, when you're talking to them at the, at the coffee you know, in the break room, but, you know, if you're not seeing them or talking to them on a daily basis, only on an as needed basis. So it's tough to try and schedule time to catch up with people as opposed to it just happening organically because yeah. you're in the same spot. So there, those, those are the things we still need to work on for sure. Absolutely. And I think the, the next generation, the, not even even the mid-level people within any, any any division or department, it's really difficult to train them and mentor them and show them those those little skills that the only sp- experiencing can give that will save them loads of time. Um, they can just kind of ask you rather than trying to schedule a Zoom call around $15 Zoom calls. Um, it's just, you know, see them in the, in, in the coffee room or, or, or in, uh, on the way to the toilet and saying, listen, I've got this quick, this quick problem. What's your what's your advice um but yeah and, and the knowledge retention um so the really experienced guys that are in the company just the, the knowledge that these guys have been able to go in and draw down on that and, and maybe them becoming a mentor um it's much more difficult working from home i'm a i'm a big believer i i think q3 this year 
Um, 80% of us will be back hopefully in the office. Um, and as you say, what will really be born out of 2020 and this whole COVID will be flexibility and the importance of spending time with your family, go, not missing the ball game with your kid, um, as you say, traveling unnecessarily. So hopefully that, that, that's what comes out of it. Um, but another thing that I wanted to kind of speak to you about is, and I always asked uh, the people that, that, that come on the podcast, especially someone like you who has got clear uh, trajectory within your career. I mean, project engineer, APM, outreach program manager, pre-construction manager, senior pre-construction manager, pre-construction executive, um, and you're still a young man. What what was the secret? Um, and what would you say is the, the I, know, I know it's hard to kind of, blow blow smoke up yourself but it's really difficult and, and what would you advise the young people to do um because we all make mistakes is there any mistakes that you made that you think you know what i i, should, I wish somebody had told me that um so i the story i always tell of um uh, of like not not so for to me it's it's like uh not celebrating too early like make sure all the all the loops are closed um staying with a task until it's 100 percent closed um, I'll never forget when I was on my first job site, um, I was responsible for um, uh, tracking the, the concrete subcontractor. It was Miller & Long, one of the biggest and best concrete subs in the country. And um, I was uh, approving their submittals and uh, it was my first submittal and I reviewed it and made some comments, stamped them, sent them to the architect. Um, the architect made some comments, approved them, sent them back. I, I got them back and I put them in the right folder in the right filing cabinet. And I was so pumped that I got my first submittal approved. And I remember like three days later, I got a call from the superintendent um, on, on the radio into the trailer. And he's like, hey, you know, what's the hold up? You know, why can't Miller and Long get their submittal back? And what you, I was like, what are you talking about? It's been approved. And he's like, well, you know, did you send them a copy of it? I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I was so excited that I got it approved. That I just put it away and never sent it back to them. And it's, um, to me, it's, uh, it really taught me a lesson in follow up. You know, make, if something's important, send it to somebody and follow up and make sure they got it. Um, and it really just just followed through and make sure things are are, are, are done. I mean, it's the the, the first 85 percent, 90 percent of anything is is the easiest part, right? It's that last 10, 15 percent to close to, to close an issue out that are really tough. Um, but that's really what the um, that last little effort is really what people remember. Good, yeah. Cl closing it out, yeah. I totally agree. I mean, pre-construction estimating as well. I mean, closing it out and getting on bid day, just kind of honing down on the on the numbers. Um, do you like the buzz of bid day? I mean, I know a lot of estimators, and and we talked about it before. Your your attention to detail is second to none. Even even uh, as I said, the commented on how beautiful your office was. It's um, it seems like you're you were cut out for this pre-construction and estimating game. I um so I, I yeah I'm, I'm involved with much less uh, hard bids nowadays, but I do miss a little bit of that, of that buzz, that excitement. Uh, I'm, I'm a competitive person as well. And, you know, winning is something in pre-construction you get to do, you get to win, right? Yeah. Um, that was one of the things that I really liked early on. Um, also, I think bid day uh, being involved is important to kind of keep your, uh, your internal pricing uh, database sharp, right? Um, yeah. Everyone who, everyone has unit prices stuck in their head from when they first learned it. And, you know, just based on time passing and escalation, they're not right anymore. Um, and so just, uh, you know, updating your own internal uh, pricing database. Um, easiest way to do that is stay involved with bids. Like, oh, man, that came in at this per square foot. That's crazy. Um, that's important. Um, as well as, you know, it's just another opportunity, another touch point with subcontractors to strengthen those relationships. The, the intense, um, detailed conversations you have with them on bid day as, as the clock's running out are, are important. Brilliant. Yeah, totally agree with you. Um, and, that, and that only comes by experience and, and keeping keeping tabs on things. Benny, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. I know the audience will get us a lot out of this, um, especially the, the junior guys. I mean, um, as I said to you before, what you've achieved in your, your career so far, it's, it's really only beginning. Um, it's, it's quite impressive. So I'm looking forward to following your story and, and especially that internal technology and that uh, collaboration piece that we talked about. I think we might have to hit you up again in the next 12 or 18 months to find out how that's going. Yeah, I, uh, I'm excited about it as well. Thank you so much for this opportunity. This is really cool. Uh, I spent some time watching some of the other episodes and just happy to be a part of it, man. It's pretty cool. Thanks, Benny.